Welcome to Service 48 and this is for the 20th of February 2022. We're looking today at uh, the book of Zechariah chapter 10 and verses 1 to 5. First as usual we will have a song and if you're interested you can find the lyrics and the chords in the video description. Ask the Lord for rain in the spring of the year. It is the Lord who sends rain clouds and showers, making the fields green for everyone. People consult idols and fortune tellers, but the answers they get are lies and nonsense. Some interpret dreams, but only mislead you. The comfort they give is useless. So the people wander about like lost sheep, they are in trouble because they have no leader. The Lord says, I am angry with those foreigners who rule my people and I am going to punish them. The people of Judah are mine and I, the Lord Almighty, will take care of them. They will be my powerful war horses. From among them will come rulers, leaders and commanders to govern my people. The people of Judah will be victorious like soldiers who trample their enemies into the mud of the streets. They will fight because the Lord is with them and they will defeat even the enemy horsemen. Well it starts off, ask the Lord for rain in the spring of the year. Well, I didn't ask for it but if you hear any odd noises there's a first 10 gale blowing outside and the rain is battering off the window on occasions. You might even hear some of the, the wheelie bins outside bouncing along. <laughs> They're merry away. So yes, we've got plenty of rain. But this little opening phrase, uh, it is the Lord who sends the rain clouds and showers, making the fields green for everyone. Well, it, it, it's a, a compacted way of saying, look, it's the Lord that makes your life sustainable, bearable, actually possible. So whether you're 
happy, whether you're sad, whether you're having an easy time or, or a difficult time, it's still the Lord. Yeah, it's still the Lord that's actually maintaining it. Our next little bit. We started with the Lord reminding us that he is the one who blesses. Now, blessings come in many, many different forms. But sometimes they come as a kind of a direct answer to a prayer. And it doesn't necessarily have to be life shattering, so important, almost the sort of 999 call, or in America, 911 call that you would make to the Lord. I can remember an occasion where I was working in a, a guitar store and in came a rather lovely Takamini acoustic electric. But it was it was four or five hundred pounds. No way could I afford that at the time. It would be, you know, married with small children. Uh, that just wasn't going to happen. But I kind of lifted my eyes to heaven and I said, Lord, you know, I would love one of them. Any chance I can have one. Now, I didn't get an answer. There were no flashes of light. No angels came down and spoke. But a couple of days later, in came one of the directors with an ovation guitar. An ovation that had been sitting in the warehouse in January and it was freezing. And he said, oh, there's something up with this guitar. The neck's bent right the way back. The strings are right on the, the frets. It's totally unplayable. Sell it for half price. Well, I thought to myself, well, if it's unplayable, selling it for half price is a bit optimistic, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just leave it behind the counter for a couple of days. See what happens in this nice, warm shop. Two days later, the neck was perfect. So I got myself an ovation for half price. How about that? Was that the Lord's handiwork? Well, I think it was. Can't prove it, but... Yes, the Lord sends blessings. It's not the prosperity gospel. No, no, no. Lord, make me rich so that everybody can see I'm rich. No, definitely not. He doesn't do that. Jesus never had two, two coins to rub together when he was asked for the temple tax. He had to tell Peter, look, Peter, go and do a wee bit of fishing. And that first fish that he catch, look at his mouth. Put a couple of coins in there. And he was right. It's okay to pray for something you just would like that would make life a wee bit better. No harm in it at all. If you don't ask, you don't get. Now, the next bit here. It's a bit of a jump. Some interpret dreams. People consult idols and fortune tellers. But the answer is that they get are lies and if you don't think about the whole thing about fortune telling if you really trust God do you have to know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or next year if you really trust God well you know he's going to be there a year from now ah, God will be there he'll, he'll meet me and together we'll work through whatever life throws at us. Now that's the attitude of faith. The people who consult any sort of fortune telling, whether it's tarot cards, uh, horoscopes, astrology, um, seances, any of that kind of stuff, all it says is we don't trust God. We want to do it ourselves. And wasn't that the very cry in the Garden of Eden? That's what happened there. Adam and Eve, they didn't trust God. So they did it their own way. And look at the trouble that came from that. 
So, just have faith. If God wants to get in touch with you and tell you something, give you a hint or a direct order, he's got plenty of different ways of doing it. He can send dreams. And if you have a dream from the Lord, you will never, ever, ever forget it. Decades later, you can still remember it. If you can't remember it after you've had your cup of coffee, it wasn't from the Lord. And he can give you visions. There are lots of different types of visions. There's the most common one's probably your mind's eye. Now, if I asked you to imagine your front door, and then I start talking about something else, well, you've lost the picture of your front door, haven't you? Because then you're listening to me. But if you get that sort of vision, it's there and it's fixed and it doesn't matter what distractions are going on round about you, you will have that picture in your mind until you understand what it's all about. So there's that type of vision. There's the movie screen. This is this, the thing that Peter saw when he had his vision in, in, the, in the book of Acts. A sheet held at four corners. That's what he called it. Hey, you and I, we'd call it a movie screen. Well, I saw one of these once. Uh, it filled a large room. It was probably, well, it was, it was at least 15 feet wide and about seven feet high. And the figures in it uh, were like an oil painting that had come to life. So there's that sort of vision. Very dramatic. It's external. The first one was, of course, internal. And I've heard of other folks having other types of vision. But if the Lord wants you to, to get a message, oh, yes, he's not short of ways of doing it. You could even have an angel turn up and have a wee chat. Aye, that happened to me once. Quite amazing. He didn't look like an angel. Plain clothes. He looked like a Celtic monk. Hey, it's Scotland. What do you expect? Right. Who said Christianity was boring? <laughs> the Lord goes on. I am angry with those foreigners who rule my people and I am going to punish them. Right. Who's he talking about? Well, it can be a wee bit confusing in Zechariah. Because in chapter 9, just before this, we've had the prophecy of the Saviour, the Messiah, entering Jerusalem on a donkey. Uh, chapter 9, the verse 9. Rejoice, rejoice, people of Zion, shout for joy. Your king is coming. Your king is coming, triumphant and victorious, but humble and riding on a donkey. That's obviously talking about Jesus. He also talks about the people being released from exile. Well, that was the Babylonians. But the Babylonians are gone. Somebody conquered them. The Jews are back in Jerusalem. And all oh, we have a reference to, I will use the men of Zion like a sword to fight the men of Greece. Oh, we're getting all sorts of time periods mixed up here because we've got the exile way back then. We've got the men of Greece who are probably just a wee bit in the future and we've got Jesus who's a good a few centuries in the future. So Zechariah is seeing he's getting a glimpse into eternity and everything happens at once. Well from our perspective everything happens at once. Someone once said that time is what stops that. Time is what stops everything happening at once. He might be right. But the Lord goes on, the people of Judah are mine, and I, the Lord Mighty, will take care of them. They will be my powerful war horses. And from them I will raise up leaders and commanders to govern my people. So total change in their situation. And in this particular passage, I think we're justified in replacing the word 
Judah and Jerusalem with the church. I think this is this is a reference to how Christianity will be victorious. You can't do that as a kind of blanket thing all, all through the Old Testament, but I think in this particular instance we, we're, we're quite safe at doing so. So how does it feel to be one of God's victorious soldiers? As you grow into the, the world this week and meet all the usual folk, you remember that. Now let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and evermore. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from Him, who was, who is, and is to come. To church throughout the world, from seven spirits for his throne, grace and peace to you from him, who was, who is, and is to come. Jesus, firstborn from the dead. The faithful witness to us all, grace and peace to you from him, who was, who is, and is to come, ruler of the kings of earth, the Lord be Grace 